Hello again, folks. We have another live show coming at you. We are in the 50th Time Teens Division sector inland from Gold Beach. We're in the little village of Langev. And we have two people out. Oh, that's Colin coughing. We have two people out there on, on for us today. We have Mag doing the photography and Colin only audio so we can hear him so we don't double up through Mag's phone. So um, here we are in the village of Langev, and that is a view north. But I'll bring Colin in. And Colin, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Good. So what are we talking about today, Colin? We're going to be talking about the attack on Langev on the 14th of June, 1944, by the 9th Battalion of the Durham Light Infantry, the battalion that is nicknamed the Gates of Gurkhas. It was a nickname they were given basically on formation because the men were so small and squat, and because of light infantry, they had green jackets. Like the Gurkhas, they called them the Gates of Gurkhas. And the May Boys. And you're from that part of the world. Right? For those who don't know you, Colin, Colin is a battlefield guide like me, as is, as is Mag. We all live in Bayer, not together. Well, me and Mag do. Colin lives a few hundred yards away. Um, but you're part of that world. You're, you're a Geordie, although technically you're an Irishman, but we don't go down that rabbit hole. But explain to us what had happened yesterday, 77 years ago, with regards to Villa Bacage. Colin, I've lost you again. Hang on. We've got some audio problems, folks. Hang on, bear with us. Have you got me now? I've got you now, Colin. Yeah, yeah, super. Right, I'll stand here. I won't move. I shall right. just stand here. So, what was I saying? Yes, it started on the 10th of June with the 1st Battalion Royal Rifles, 2nd Battalion Essex, and they were given the task of coming in from the west of Longev and therefore taking the town, the village of Longev. That was met with really stiff resistance on the western side of town, and on the 12th of June, they were ordered to withdraw, and that took the best part of the 12th of June to get them out, and they moved back behind a little village to the northwest of Longev called Bernier Bocage, and they're going to be replaced in exactly that spot by the 9th Battalion Durham Light Infantry, who are given the task on the 13th because there's been a bit of a shit show in Villiers Bocage. And basically, the brigade are ordered to keep up the pressure on the German forces in the area. Defending the area here, we've got Panzer Grenadiers of the Panzer. I've lost the audio again, Colin. I think, Mag, we might have to switch to your audio. Colin, move up to Mag and we'll use, we'll use Mag's audio. This is fine when we have these audio issues. Can you hear me, Mag? Have you got us again? Uh, I have got you again, yeah. Am I in or out? Right. You're in. And the bells. So, where was I up to? The shit show at Villiers Bacard, which is obviously an awful mess, and everybody's acquainted with what happened there because of all the bloody white Michael Whitman fans. So, Lieutenant Colonel Woods of the 9th and Lieutenant Colonel Green of the 6th Battalion, the 8th Battalion are going to be left out of this one from the 151st Brigade because they've had a really terrible few days down in Saint-Pierre, which is to the east of Tilly Sir Searle. So they go to the, the meeting with Brigadier Walton and he basically tells them, take Longev, it has to be taken. Lieutenant Colonel Woods then states that this should be carried out at night and that we need proper time to make reconnaissance. That is refused and basically they have to go on the following morning. And it's all to relieve the pressures coming from Villiers Bacage with the Germans. The Germans. I've lost Colin's audio again. Mag, we're going to have to switch to your audio. F forget Colin's audio. We'll just use yours. My audio. So, yeah. where was I up to, Paul? So, don't repeat. You were up to having to go in on daylight. Right, 
right, now we're the bells as well, folks. Hang on. He's doing something. We, we've, got, we've got the bells. I can't hear anyway because of the bells. This is lovely, isn't it, folks? Live TV. Can't hear Colin. Can't hear because of the bells. So, folks, I'll just do a bit of introduction. So, let me tell you where we are on this map here. This is the village of, of Langev. And Mag is standing around in the church here. And we're going to be talking about um, the attack fine. coming in from the north here. This is what Colin's going to be talking about. We're just going to resolve the audio issues. Let me, let me, let me see if we, Colin can come in again. Sorry about this, folks. <laughs> Colin, can you hear me? I do apologize a bit, folk. Technical issues. Mag, you'll have to unplug your headphones and have it so Colin can hear me through your phone. Okay. I think that's the only thing we can do. Oh, hang on! I've just got your back. Oh, hang on! I've just, just got your back. Well, I, I just want to get your earphones. Hang on! Just want to get your earphones. Who have we got then? Then you won't be able to get us. Yeah. I can't hear Colin. Turn your mic on, Mag. Right? right can you hear us me. now? On Mag, just here. So, where was I up? Who, who am I meant to be listening? Whose microphone are we using now? Mags. Right. So, Mag, okay, I can, Mag. Okay. I can see you now then. Right. So right. you can hear me now, can you, Colin? I can, yes. Good. Where was I up to? You were up to coming in in daylight. Yes, which they didn't want to do, but they have no choice. They've got to relieve the pressure. And so, basically, artillery is going to be deployed at 10 o'clock and at 10.15 the Durhams are going to move on the village of Longev. So they're situated to the north. And you can see up there, hopefully you can see the fields. And you've got on, because there's a little road that runs down into the village from the area of Bernier Bocage. And you see the farmhouse over there, possibly. So the road's the dividing line. That's the battalion axis. And you've got A and B companies will come in on the eastern side of the road, C and D companies on the west. There's very little intelligence available to the command. Uh, B Company of 9th Battalion will go out around 7 o'clock on the evening of the 13th. Uh, basic company strength, one platoon left in reserve, and they're going to come in to hopefully find out where the Germans are situated and get any intelligence they can. That, as it comes through the cornfield, which they're going to follow the same cornfield the following day, that is going to be met with very stiff resistance with German machine guns firing on fixed lines, mortar attacks coming into them, and basically B Company is going to take a hell of a lot of casualties and nine dead just on that reconnaissance uh, patrol. So we know very little. There are night patrols on the 13th, but again, very, very little intelligence is gathered about German strength. And the reason for the daylight attack, as explained by the brigadier, is we can't allow the defences to stiffen. So we have to go as early as possible. And at 10 o'clock, we're going to have the artillery barrage commence. And there's three field regiments of self-propelled, which is the 86th, the 90th and the 147th. We then have the 5th Royal Artillery Group, and they are going to have three uh, field regiments, three medium regiments, one heavy regiment, and we also have an American artillery battalion all firing onto the woods, which are in front of me there to the north. Because that is where the main German defences are. And on the my right, so it'll be your left if we're looking from the Durham's point of view, there's a tiger situated there. During the reconnaissance patrol by B Company, one of the German tanks was knocked out as were two Shermans. So on the 13th, we've lost two of the supporting Shermans, which will come from 4-7 Royal Dragoon Guards. Infantry, uh, the artillery opens up, and then in come a squadron of typhoons. And they're going to drop an estimated 120 tonnes of bombs onto those woods, 
And also, they will all fire rockets into the tree line as well. Um, the commander of Air Company, uh, Darcy Irvin, he is going to watch all that. And he said, nothing could possibly be alive after all of that is hit. So the artillery is directed on the start of the woods, also the typhoons, and then it's a rolling barrage as the men come through. So the attack starts off at 10.15. A Company in the lead, C Company on the west. As they're coming through the cornfields, the Germans, for about 80 yards in front of their position, have scythed the corn down to give them a full field of open fire. And of course, as we get to that point, the Germans, who were obviously very well disciplined, um, had held their fire, just the odd automatic burst and the odd mortar shell, but then they opened up with everything they had along the front. And, of course, Air Company will take the worst casualties of that because the co biggest concentration is in the woods on the east of the road, not where the farmhouse is on the west. So they're then getting just absolutely hammered. Thankfully, they had tank support, and they're opening up with machine guns and, of course, firing from the Sherman tanks into the woods. But the Germans are pretty well entrenched. The, there is one report that says the Germans were lying in the bottom of their foxholes, had the machine guns on fixed positions, and were using string to fire the machine guns so they never had to put their heads above the parapets when all that barrage was coming in. And so the attack kind of stalls momentarily. We have carrier platoons coming in. And, of course, Lieutenant Colonel Woods is on a carrier, and he's got with him Lieutenant Jack Williams, and Sergeant Charlie Eagles, who had a kind of premonition about something, and he jumped off the carrier and he ran alongside it instead of sitting in it. And Lieutenant Williams asked him why, and he says, I don't know. And so Williams said, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me, and he jumped off as well. And as they were coming in, they were moving forwards. Carriers are coming forward, and there is they get a bit separated from Humphrey Woods's uh, carrier, who they should have been with. They end up next to another carrier, which then gets walloped with a mortar shell. And that kills the driver, uh, but the corporal inside, he's still alive, but he has lost a leg at this stage. And so Eagles and Williams help them get them into a cover position where they can be found by medics at a later time and they head back towards Colonel Woods as he's running over to Colonel Woods uh, Lieutenant Williams uh, gets shouted at by Woods to go back and lead the platoon in as he's travelling back towards Sergeant Eagles he gets hit in the thighs, both thighs and that's not as in Wigan thighs by the way, it's thighs at the top of your legs he goes down in a heap right at Sergeant Eagle's feet. And he said to Sergeant Eagles, if they have shot my balls off, shoot me. <laughs> and so Eagles said, I'll have a look. He didn't actually. Oh. He didn't actually have a look because he couldn't prepare himself to do it. But he slung him on his back, took him back into the cornfield about 100 yards where he found the medic and left Lieutenant Williams with the medic. He did survive. Eagles then goes back in. He's totally lost where his company or his platoon is meant to be. He meets up with a couple of stragglers who've actually crossed the road and come from C Company. And it really is just getting messy. And so all the reserve is sent in. So D Company on the west and what's left of B Company is going to come down on the eastern side of the road. And they're supposed to pass through, but it's still a struggle. And we're now over an hour. It's after 11 o'clock now. And the casualties are still mounting. German snipers in the trees as well, tied in, firing down, hitting anything that looks like an officer. And basically, A Company does not have an officer left. Every single one is now a casualty. Still, they keep coming, but A and B are really suffering on this side of the road. At around 5 to 12, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Woods is going to radio his second in command, which is Major James Mogg. Now, Mogg has only just joined the regiment about seven days before D-Day. He has no combat experience. He's come from infantry battle school. He is a career soldier, but this is going to be his first time in combat in World War II. Woods radios him and 
he gets the message back that the going's a little better on the western side. And so the decision is made. We're going to pull A and B out. And we're going to push in with C and D on that side. And A and B is going to make an arc around and follow in down the side of the farmhouse over there. And follow in with C and D. Just after that transmission, Woods is having a chat with his uh, Lieutenant Reed, who is his intelligence officer. And that is when the carrier that was stood next to took a direct hit. And Lieutenant Colonel Woods is going to lose his life. Now, interestingly enough, when Major Mogg joined the uh, battalion, who, of course, were locked down, I think, in Camp 18 at that stage, they, uh, he, he didn't really know the guy. So they, had, they both had a pass to leave the camp. And so he took them for lunch to Salisbury. Uh, and they went to the Haunch of Venison pub. And they had a nice lunch, got to know each other. And then over port, Lieutenant Colonel Wood said to Major James Mogg, I won't survive this one. And on the 14th of June, his prediction was proved right. He didn't. He died almost immediately after he'd been hit. And so now, Major Mogg, no combat experience, has to lead the battalion. And he's going to swing in, D Company have passed C now because there's very little left to C Company. And they're going to swing round and they're going to come see, see that building in front, which will become uh, Battalion HQ. They're going to swing round and over onto the main road. And now it's all about clearing this little village. Well, Mr. Colin, show us the bit over that fence, the bit we walked to on the recce, and show us that looping around the farm, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, yeah it's just up here. It was just so just, I'll just remind people where they are at the moment on the on the map, folks. So I'll just zoom in for you, folks. So they started off here near the church, and the bit they're now walking up this road here. So they're just about to come up to this corner here, and this corner here is where you can see where, but ha having had four companies on two sides of the road, they're now all on the western side of the road, and they're looping round. There's some rather thick hedgerows around here, which gave them cover. The Germans are over here, by the way. So that's where the Germans predominantly were. So you can see here they're blindsided them coming in here. And I'll put it, hand it back to Colin now. Yeah, so this, this is the, the battalion axis. This is the road we're looking up now. And you can see, even though a lot of the vegetation has been taken away from what was here in 1944, you can't see that farmhouse. Your, your, your line of sight is very poor until you're through the Germans defending in the wooded area over there. It's really poor. So I'll show you over the gate. I'll get Mags to lean over. <laughs> now you lean through there, Mag. And so that's the way they came. All, all four companies are going to come down through there. Due to the fact A and B have to be pulled out because they've just taken so many casualties. And C company at this stage, by the time they hit the village, are down to one platoon. That is it. So many casualties for the Durhams on this day. So the worst day in, well, it's the worst day in Northwest Europe campaign for the ninth. It really is. So while all this is going on, which will give us a chance now to walk to the main road, while all this is going on, you have now at 11.30, you've got the attack in the West by the 231st Brigade, which is led, I think, by the Hampshires, but they're not my thing. But I think it's the Hampshires up front. And they're going to be attacking into a village called Sonodier and Le Belle Epine. And over in the northeast, we have the 6th Battalion Durhams, and they're attacking the village of Verrier. So it's all about linking up on this diagonal line, basically, from Belle Epine to Verrier. And this is at the heart of it. And this is where the vast majority of the German defenders in that area were situated. And the reason the second attack didn't go till 1130 is because they wanted the artillery to support that as well. And they've only got what they've got. So there was a bit of a difference in the time, which meant the Germans were coming into this area from the areas that were going to be attacked either side of the village, which meant they didn't suffer as much as the troops who did come into here. So D companies come in first. You can see across the road, there's some buildings and they will have to be cleared and every single one. But we do still have some tanks. We've still got the 4-7 Royal Dragoon Guards. And three of them have made it into the village in support. Morg sets up his command post. He's now battalion commander. 
and he has to clear the village and then deploy. So the tanks will come down and they're going to help the troops clear all the buildings in the village, basically firing the machine guns into them. 75 mil shells, whatever it is, the firing. And the village will be cleared at around one o'clock. And that's the Germans have gone now. So it's about consolidation. And the way we consolidate the village is you kind of make a little box, which is British Army ta tactics. And so here, where I'm standing, we deploy the carriers. And the carriers are going to block the road to the west. All the little alleyways will have anti-tank guns put on them. So you can see there's a little alleyway over there. And all the roads out of town. So if we go back up to the church, there, there is a road out to the south. And that will be covered. And that's going to be blocked by the one remaining platoon of C Company. And they'll also have some support from an anti-tank gun. And one of the Shermans will station by the church to cover that road. And also the road that goes out behind the church. And then D Company are going to block the main road, which runs down to tilly sur -Sur, And also the road that's going to be covered by the Sherman. So it's now a matter of waiting. People are digging into their positions, utilising farmhouses where they can, buildings that are still standing because there's an awful lot of fire gone onto this town. And it's a matter of wait and see now. And that is where the German counterattacks come in. And they can counterattack from three directions. They can come from the east, from the west, and from the south. And they do. Now, anti-tank guns are situated over the brow of that hill running down towards where the cemetery is. Now, Major Mogg has deployed all the anti-tank guns on frontal fire, which he admits was a big, big mistake. Because when the first German counterattack came in, four of the five anti-tank guns, the six-pounders they had with them, are knocked out. Gone. So we're struggling. One anti-tank gun situated down towards the cemetery, which is towards the direction of Tilly, that opens fire on a panther, and that kind of stops the panther. It's not totally out of action yet. And Major Mog will go down with three others uh, with a piet, so they're crawling through the Bocage countryside to get a look at it. They've got a piet gun, and he says to the guy with them, whose name I can't remember, but the guy with him, he says, right, shoot it with a piet gun. He says, I don't know how it works, sir. And he's carried this from D Day to the 14th of June. And he has no idea how to use it. So Major Mog fires it, and that then knocks the tiger out. It the, uh, sorry, the panther out, and it brews up. So that's one tank stopped. Two more will come down the Tilly Road. And Sergeant Harris is up there in his Sherman, which I don't know what he called it, but he's up there in his Sherman. And he stops a second panther. And a third one comes in from behind it. And using the other two that are knocked out as a screen, starts firing. And I believe it's that that takes out the Sherman tank at the church and knocks that out. Harris falls back and basically takes up position there, just on this corner. We look down there where the cows are. And that allows them to cover anything coming from the south, the west, the west and the east. And later in the afternoon, there's going to be another attack by the Germans. And three Panthers are going to roll down from Bellapine, which is to the west of Longeve. And they're going to come down. And as they come down, Sergeant Harris and I think it's Trooper McKillop, who's his gunner. And he's going to open fire. And, of course, you'll, you'll have the famous picture Paul of the Panther knocked out just on that little stretch near the bridge there. So I'm sure you can we'll do that in a minute. Yeah, we'll do that in a minute. Yeah. So that, that's knocked out there. A second one comes past it. That gets hit again by Harris and McKillop. That is not totally destroyed and just keeps on running. And another famous photograph, of course, is at the Cenotaph. Uh, sorry, yeah, the Cenotaph in Longev for the first war, and that basically comes to a stop there and the German crew bailed out. And they were taken prisoner by C Company who were holding the farmhouse there, looking to the south. And a third one is stopped just on the junction. So three Panthers are stopped. Only one brews up, but the other two are debilitated enough for the crews to abandon and leave them. And it keeps progressing. 
Uh, patrols are sent out with what little men they've got just to find out the whereabouts of the Germans and hopefully stop them from coming in. And then at 7.30 in the evening, uh, typhoons are going to come across again. And that cuts off a German counterattack coming from the south. Um, basically, that's Longev in a nutshell. Well, we've got more to do because we'll, when we get to the bridge, when we get to the town, we'll match up all the photos and yeah, show yeah, all yeah. that. But just we'll just walk pop up across the, the road and well, show us bridge. that lane, the, the, the lane oh, we went to yeah. across the other side of the yes, road, just yes, so yes. we get an idea of how different the terrain changes. Yeah. Well, I'm wiping the sweat from my brow. It is absolutely... Jeez. I'm not designed for weather like this, Paul. No, oh, you're really you're, not. You're, yeah. At least you're not ginger, though. I used to be, though. I know, when I'm you only, were young. I'm only great because I've got kids. <laughs> now, the reason we wanted to show you this view is this is coming in. I'll show you where we are there walking on a map because I want to show you how <laughs> very quickly the terrain can change because those northern fields they came down, which was I mean, they have to come in from the north because that's where Gold Beach is. That's where they've been coming from. You can see on this on this image here how open and exposed they are. And as Colin said there, they changed their tack to a come round here and attack through here. But when you go to the Locked south, you suddenly get this sort of more, more bocage again. So show us the view yeah. kind of across the wall. Well, you can't even really see the church, can you? But if you go a bit further down the lane. Yeah. It's a bit, and the, and the, the internet quality is not amazing down yeah, there. the first house. Oh, I've lost, I've lost Mag now. I should be back in a minute. So we've got sound. Yep, we got you back. Yeah, it's just down this lane. It's just, it's the buildings. It's just must be blocking the signals. We we did it. We did a set a, a, a comms check the other day, and it seemed fine. But okay, let's walk back to the bridge, and we'll talk about those those famous photos. Oh. Yeah, heading to the bridge now. Max keeps trying to decapitate me with these bloody headphones of hers. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah you're to, yeah okay. Yeah, you're hating her headphones, right? So keep on going. So there's that very distinctive church, folks. And if you stop on the left-hand side of the road, we'll match up the photos in a minute. Yeah. So I see. So Mag Mag's phone has his headphones are into Colin's ears, so we can hear. Okay, yeah. I've got it now. Yeah. Brilliant. So yeah. Uh, so Everybody's slowing down. Where the flowers are. Yeah. Don't get run over again. Where do you want us to go next? Just a bit further up, so we can match up the photo. I want to better see the building beyond the trees, really. Oh. That'll do. Yeah, about there. So just hold that image, Mag, so it, gets, it steadies up. And show, show the, the middle of the road, and I'll put the water in it. So there we are, folks. So what, that's why the panther tank's knocked out right on the left there. So you can see the panther tank. There's a church. There's a building. And there's a second panther tank over there on the right-hand side. So I'll put it back on Mag's image. So one panther here. And one pan the other side of the road there. Yeah. And then if you turn round, Mag, so I can show back up towards uh, towards the, the the other well the west. I want to match up another photo. Spin right the way round, one eighty. Right. See see the building there on the corner. I know that the light's a bit bad now, but there's the view there. There's that same building. There's the panther there to the right. And um, there's that. You can see the road bends off there to the left, which is that same bend you can see there. So that's that same building there. So we're matching you up exactly in the right location again. And then spin round again, 180. And you can kind of wander up to the church now, folks. Turn round. Right. And here are a couple of close While Colin's walking, here are a couple of close-up photos of those two Panthers. And by the way, this is in terms of the British or Commonwealth Army in Normandy. This is a fairly early action against Panthers. The, Kevin, the Canadian uh, 7th, 8th and 9th Brigades have knocked out a couple of Panthers up in places like Bretville, Lorgiers, Norham, Bessam. But this is fairly early. Um, and when we're talking about Normandy, often Americans are saying how difficult the terrain was for their troops and the hedgerows. And that is a consideration. But the fact is... In the American sector, the first few weeks, they were only up against self-propelled guns. Uh, they were up against none of these uh, Panthers uh, that the British and Canadians were up against. That happens much later in Normandy campaign. So when people want to be um, critical of General Montgomery and the slowness of the British 
as they push on the Canadians, they push in Normandy. Don't forget, we're dealing against the uh, the majority of the German armor. And for my money, Panzer Leia, which is the German division we're talking about, is is about the best um, German um, armor division in Normandy at this stage. Some other ones arrive later on. I'll put it on uh, Colin's image again, or Mag's image again. So we're coming up to the church yeah. now. I'm just having a nosebleed incident, Paul. You're having a nosebleed now. I'm having a the nosebleed altitude? incident. Yeah. Good okay, grief. We've had, we've had everything today. Yeah, yeah. No connection, nosebleeds. Dear me. Well, there, there's old speckled hen in the fridge for when you get back, folks. Good. I've got eight in the back of the car, but they're too hot. They're too warm. They're too hot. So while they're you walk warm. up, I'll just show some water, some pre-war photos of, of the square. So this is exactly where they're walking. There's that same view. You hold that shot for a second there, Mag. So you see the church on the left. Now, the buildings around the crossroads now have been replaced to the right of the church. But if you look at the photo again there, you can see the equivalent buildings there. Um, that's the that's a pre-war photo. That's pretty cool. And um, a pre-war fo war photo of the church there as well, just to give you a bit of um, sense of time and place. Yeah. And now I guess if you stand around the war monument and just kind of spin around and carry on talking about the actions, I'll show up the I'll match up the yeah. photos, okay? And so if you want to give basically, say company are using those farm buildings. So if we went into that driveway, you would see where C company have deployed to cover this road, which goes south, of course. And the war memorial takes a bit of a peppering during the battle, and one of the uh, panthers that got knocked or disabled partly towards the bottom by Sergeant Harris. It comes to a rest here. Yeah. Basically on C Company's position. Comes so if, Mag, if you there. hold the images there, so let those image, I'll, I'll put the wartime images up. I don't know right, why the signal's the not better than it should be. So here are the wartime Probably shots we have of the Panther. You see the war monument there, folks. And here are two photos. That, if you spin around to the church, Mag. Church. Not me. There we are. Not me. I've got a nosebleed. So there's a the church. See the war monument. See the church there. And there, there you see the damage, the wartime damage. There's holes yeah. in the side of the church there. I'm putting the wartime photos up. And now if you face um, towards Tilly, if you wouldn't mind. Hang on. I just, I just want to show this side of the war memorial because it's got the most spang on it. Hang really? On. Yep. Let your image steady, Mag. Brilliant. There we go. There's the, there's the span. And that's Sergeant Harris in the photo there, folks, who Colin was talking about earlier. Yeah. So, Tilly, if we look down this road, which is what? So, seven, eight minutes away by car. Maybe it's less. Um, but that's looking down towards Tilly. And as you go down that road, there's a civilian graveyard. And that is where the six pounder is situated. Now, uh, hold with that, Sergeant, with hold Sergeant that exact Hayes. shot there, Mag. That's perfect. Hold that shot. It's perfect. There shot, we Mag. are. Hold there's that. the corner of the church. There's the building on the right hand side. And there's one of the knocked out Shermans. So remind us again how many Panthers were knocked out in this action because it gets a bit complicated because a couple are outside the village. So are they counted as part of Langev? In total, if we include the ones uh, on the road, nine, it's, but it's nine, nine, German, nine German tanks. They're not all Panthers. There's a couple of Mark IVs knocked out. Yep. Um, but so, yeah, inside the village, we have got one, two, three, four. No. Three directly inside the village, and we've definitely got two uh, just down below where the uh, civilian cemetery is. And there is, so there's five, in fact, in the village, but one's knocked out in the initial attack. Um, another one was knocked out on the night of the 13th by a, uh, a tracked 25 pounder knocked it out. And so that it still gets counted because the battalion took it out. So it's nine in total that it is credited with. So now, spin, spin around a little bit more to the left, and we'll get match up the other photos. So the war monuments on your left, to the left, Mag, the other left, the metric the left, left. Left, left, turn left, turn left. Oh, she's Said. going all. She's going. She's going all. Doing a one, a three sixty. Okay, yeah. bit further. Mag can't. Mag can't hear you. I know further. it's complicated. It's a bit further. Bit further. Bit, bit further. further. 
You got it yet? Bit, bit more, tiny bit more. That That's is. the view there. There we are. They, the wall monitor is just on the left, that photo there. But that building at the back there is the equivalent building, and that's the road down there towards um, towards the west. It's quite cool. Yeah. So, casualties. As I said, there's an awful lot of them. Now, the 9th Battalion set off with approximately 590 men on the morning of June the 14th. When this was all over... They'd lost 248, either killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. That's a staggering amount of casualties for one battalion to take. And yeah. Sergeant Eagles, who I mentioned before, he, before we're even in the village, he's going to be taken prisoner right next to the farmhouse. And he will be taken prisoner along with four of us. Um, they're taken away by the Germans about a mile and a half down a sunken lane at the back uh, leading to the woods, uh, and they're kept there. But on the 15th of June, the German major who'd taken the prison, Eagle said they were treated very, very well by the Germans and they shared rations with them and they shared cigarettes with the Germans. The major surrendered to Sergeant Eagle's. Because he realised, because the line had linked up late in the evening of the, the 14th, uh, so we've linked up with 6th Battalion, we've linked up with 231st Brigade down the road, and the Major decides that he's going to surrender. And so he asks Sergeant Eagles to go back to the Durham lines and tell him he's got a number of Germans who wish to make a surrender. And... Eagles doesn't want to do it because he knows that people are going to be trigger happy and a bit jumpy after the battle of the 14th. Uh, so he suggests the major comes with them, along with two other German officers. And Eagles takes two of the prisoners with him, uh, other prisoners of war with him. And they go and they do get to link up with the Durhams. And the situation is explained. And they brought in 100 members of the Panzerlia as prisoners of war who had surrendered. And Eagle said they were very happy to do so. So, and um, Major Kennedy of A Company, is it A Company? I think it is, yeah. He remarked, uh, when interviewed about this, he remarked that he couldn't, because he always referred to the Durhams as Geordies. Doesn't matter where you come from, because of course a battalion is not just all from the Durham area at this stage, right? Um, in fact, of the 34 who lost their lives in the Battle of Longev, uh, only five were actually from County Durham, and one was from Northumberland. There's, there's, there's five from London were killed. So that's what happens when you're a frontline battalion, I suppose, and you've fought all through the war. You take a lot of losses, and they've got to be replaced. But the officers always refer to them as, a, as the Geordies. And Major Kennedy said... it. It am amazed him till the day he will die that when the Geordies, as he refers to them, took prisoners on entering Longev, that we didn't shoot any of them. Quite, quite telling, isn't it? Mm. And I know I'm biased towards these people, but there you go. But it, it is when you think how many have lost their lives, have been wounded badly in those fields, in that cornfield, that they left. And they didn't. They just took the prisoners. They just disarmed them and told them to march across the field. It's as simple as that. And the Germans did all walk away. And every man who was interviewed about the taking of prisoners that I've read about and come across all said they were quite happy to walk over to British lines once they'd been taken prisoner. They weren't bothered about trying to escape. And so we didn't even send guards on them. We just sent them in the direction of the reserve brigade. But we have no reserve here because every company was thrown in. So there's just nothing left. And here is a lovely memorial from the land of the Prince Bishops, which is what County Durham is known as. And it is from the fire service. And yeah, it's a lovely, a lovely memorial. That's fairly yeah. recent, that one. Is it it's about, what, six, seven years old or something? Yeah, about that, Paul, yeah about that it's not not been here that long well it can't have been because you hadn't seen it till friday 
No. Or, or I'd forgotten about it. But I never oh, paid attention forgot. to anybody from the north. You yeah. know me. I'm only interested in the Essex Yeah, I know regiment. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because the Durhams had to come in and do the Essex job for them. You know? Yeah. I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to get that in, Paul. But you kind of forced me hand there. Eh? Yeah, you know, yeah, it's just, just banter. It's just banter. Yeah, but the, the Essex suffered absolutely dreadful in the, the, the yeah, 10th, while, 11th while you're and 12th. Walking across, I played the footage from inside the church with the memorial to the Essex and the right. memorial to the DLI. So our, our local regiments are side by side in the church. Yeah. So if they can be side by side there, you and I can play nicely. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And if you show us the other monument to the left, Mag, or Duncan, uh, Colin. Yeah, this way, Mag. So we've got and the sterling, uh, a sterling rather... camera work considering the, the the temperature and the connectivity yeah. issues. So we we've got a, a a rather modern one to a typhoon pilot. Now these have started cropping up in a lot of places in normally Paul, haven't they? And they're yeah. nice to see. Um, but I tried to find a photo of them. I couldn't I couldn't find one. So I tried to find one of Godfrey uh... Jones, but I I wasn't able to. We should get pictures of them all, and then you get Borny on, because he's a typhoon guy, isn't he? Yeah. And there's the 50th day of memorial. Front mm -hmm. line from uh, Belgium in 1940, all through the desert, Sicily, and then they're brought back for this. As Montgomery once said to them in Sicily, after the Battle of Sicily was over, he said, wherever I go, I'm taking the 50th division with us. And then yeah. in December 1944, he disbanded the division. Broke my grandfather's heart, that. Glorious yeah. 50th division were disbanded. The Durham's, uh, the 151st Brigade, the Durham Brigade will be broken up. And the 6th and 8th will be sent back to the UK. And the 9th go all the way through to Germany with as part of 7th Armoured. So... That's what you get for being good at your job, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I think we've finished. I think you can head off to the little location on the outside of town for yeah, that. Yeah, we'll head to and the, then we'll, um, we'll, we'll move on. Yeah, we'll head to the um, the Calvary, Paul, I think is the correct yeah. name for I'll it. Put it, on, put it on my screen for a minute while you're moving. So hopefully you followed that, folks. So sorry about the, uh, the, the image quality there or the, the, um, the connectivity issue. So... Um, this was the image we were showing, the map we were showing earlier. This is from the book pa uh, Pans in the Battle of Normandy. It's You can find this online. It shows the action around the church here with the various Panthers knocked out. You know, because I say it's, it's, it's not just Panthers. There was, uh, there, was, there was Mark IVs as well. I'll mute you for a second, Mag, while you're driving. And it shows, again, the, 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 the attack coming in from the north there. And we, we, we covered that with Colin's brilliant explanation there. But we're, they've got two, about a two-minute drive ahead of them. So while they're doing that, I'm going to just uh, put it on my screen for a second, and uh, then I'll get a couple of images ready for you. So uh, where are we going? Here we go. Try and do a lot again tonight, folks. It's That's how I do it. So this is the role of honor. Uh, the Colin survived me for the Durham Light Infantry. So this is one battalion. So remember, a, a battalion at full strength, maybe 800 men, but they were very rarely at full strength. But this is killed in one day in one attack. So, you know, you've got the, the Lieutenant Colonel Woods there, uh, another officer, sergeants, corporals, lance, and all these privates there. So for one village, and this is the theme we're talking about. Don't forget this week, folks. We're talking about attrition beyond the beachhead. We're talking about the difficulty the Allies face pushing in land, attacking was difficult. The Germans are fiercely defending these locations. And as we're finding out in Langev, they're also prone to the counterattack. That's something that has become a real feature of the, of the fighting in the British and Canadian sector is the British, the Canadians would advance. They would gain a bit of ground, hold it, and then the Germans would counterattack. And then the British would have to regain that ground. And it's why... You know, the, the, in the end, the Allies are moving kind of inch by inch through Normandy because of this difficulty. And um, the Germans kind of know what they're doing. It's been a discussion in the, in the sidebar there about Panzer Lairs and, and their their nature. They you know, they were decent kit, Panther tanks. They Some of them have, have, have fought in Eastern Front. They're pretty well led. They come into Normandy. They, they, they're they good at adjusting the terrain. And essentially, they're a pretty good um, unit. So, um, and Paul Arrington adding there, the DLI uh, memorial that Mag just showed you is Durham Sandstone, was blessed by the Bishop of Durham before being transported to Langev. It was brought over by Alan Patterson and other friends. So that's where it came from. So we should be nearly at their next stop. And this is a little bonus stop, really. 
that we're just cutting into. There should be there any moment there. Uh, they're just driving up the village there. And you can see how the internet connectivity in Normandy varies greatly. Where we were the other day was really superb, and here, not so good. Although it seemed fine when we did our check the other day. But, hey, that's um, that's the perils of live TV for you. Um, I'll just, while they're driving up, I'll just show those same photos again of the square because they are such great photos, and you can find these. These ones are slightly more unusual. These ones I found uh, in a Heimdall book on Tilly Sir Searle of the church there. They're not great quality. And that one there, you can see... Uh, the tank there in front, and there's the war memorial. You can see there's a huge hole through the side of the church there, which um, was caused by the fighting on this day and, and the typhoons and the bombardments, not just the ground fighting. Um, and these are locals looking at You can see how why the, the village square had to be repaired. Some of these houses have taken a massive great battering, and that's the view that, that that's the, that they're driving off that road there, folks, in fact, is where they're going. I think they should be this about there now. Yep, they should be there. Can you hear me, guys? No, I can't. Let right. The so calvary. there we have. We have a calvary. We have a Jesus Christ there. And the interesting, I wanted to match you up here. So this is just about well, been two minutes drive outside of the town. because, And it's a, not a very great quality photo, this. But bear with me. If you go, Mag goes the field beyond. It's me, Paul. It's me. It's me. So oh, it's the interior okay. photo work now is me. Okay. So are you in the field then? I am in the field, Paul. The image quality is not particularly good, but here's oh, this photo. Very overgrown it is too. So this was go. a temporary cemetery. Uh, the graves have all been removed somewhere. These are graves here from June 1944. There's the, the cow there there. had a fence around it at the time. And there's a, if you see the, tri the, the roof shape there, if you, can you show us the roof of the building on the side of the road, Colin? Oops, camera's going funny, Matt. There, there we the are. There's that the building. Of the road. Yeah. So there's the one in the photo there. There is that same bit. So a panther was not. If you look at the photo there, folks, see it in the photo. There's that panther. That which which one was that again? That's the one knocked out by the the uh, anti tank guns. We think. The, is that right, the, Colin? Yeah, yeah. Well, disabled by the anti tank gun, then knocked out. I finished off with a piet. Finished off with a piet. So it was yeah. hit by the anti tank. So if you show us that, so that's where that was hit. Somewhere basically, there's a modern house there now, but that panther was just on the left there. There is. I'll just show you the gateway to it. Um, but it's somebody's house, so I shouldn't really film the house. But I'll... so the gateway is, it must be this one. I've changed the gate, Paul. It will be just outside that house. Yeah. Along so there. there's that panther there, and there's the, 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 the calvary there. Or the Calvary Cross, depending on in which language. So I'll let yeah. you drive on to your last stop. We're going to bring. Yeah, you we'll head uh, head down to the cemetery now. All of the dead from Longev on the fourteenth are actually buried in Bayer Cemetery because the Tilly Cemetery wasn't in use at that time. So all the bodies are taken to Bayer for final burial, uh, and they're all still there. All thirty-four of them who lost their life. Thirty-two Durhams, and of course. Who attached? So, Lieutenant Colonel Walt Humphrey Corps and the other fella whose name I really try to recall uh, is from the Sussex Regiment, the Royal Sussex Regiment. It's on your list that I sent you, Paul. Yeah. Of the. Um, uh, Lieutenant the, uh, Thornton. Oh, cool. Thornton. Yeah, he's he's Sussex. Head for the cemetery, Mag. He is Sussex. So I don't this know is a photo that Colin took the other day of um, Lieutenant Colonel Wood's uh, grave in by a, a portrait. And he had his own grave there for a while with a tank behind it. So that's the Imperial War Museum photo we're using there. So to remind you, folks, as Colin just said there, the cemetery we're going to has no dead from this particular engagement. But because it's just two minutes drive up the road, we're going to end from there because it seems fitting because... It's, it fits in this theme of what we're trying to get across to you of this attritional uh, campaign of mid-June because when we get to the cemetery in a couple of minutes, you'll see there's lots of graves of June the 10th, the 11th, 12th, 14th, 17th, 19th because this is just one day. We have highlighted one action with basically one baton and Paul Errington was watching. We could have covered the 6th 
baton down inventory as well. That could be another program in its own right. Um, and as, as Colin said, the 231st Brigade are coming in. If you have, want to know what they did, don't forget we did the show with Peter Caddick Adams back uh, early in the year about their assault on Gold Beach. They're involved in this. And this is seven days after, uh, a, few, a week after D-Day. And if you watch the show with Gert van den Bogart last night about the second division, that was happening a day earlier. So a lot is happening this time. That's the whole point of what's going on. Both sides are are jostling for position. I'll go back to the very original map I showed you at the beginning of this show. Here we go. So we were down here. The Langev is slap bang under the uh, the, the third right Nazi flag there in the Panzer division. And here's was the attempt the day before on the 13th of June to swing round and get into Villa Bocage and swing up into Caen that ultimately didn't completely work it's not a complete german victory but it was it kind of entered that standstill lots of fighting there go back and look at the program we did last year with daniel taylor for that here's the second division that was the show we did yesterday with gert pushing their way across the l division we haven't done anything about the first division recently and then here we are in the longev area just west of uh, teddy sur -Sel. and then further over towards Caen is all the confrontation with the 12th ss and you would have watched those shows with Mark Milner on the 7th and Mike Bechtold on the 11th. So that's the fighting for uh, OT, which is about here, Le Manil Patry, which is about here. So you can see all this stuff is happening at the same time. And as I always say, we tend to talk too much about what happened on the beaches. Now, I know Paul Errington and Led, he works for Ledger Tours. They're a great company. Uh, Paul Reed is also works for them. That's as Ben Main. They take people on inland battles. They take people to Langev, Tilly Sur Cell. They cover these battles. If you don't want to do the driving yourself, either if you're in country and you want to book with someone like me or Colin, do that. If not, go with Ledger. So there we are. They're in the cemetery and the signal's got better there now. So I'll let Mag and Colin just select some of the. Now he was he was sixth battalion, wasn't he? That guy. Sixth six battalion. Yeah, yeah. He's not in the. Um... He's so named. he's not in the particular attack you're talking about. But if you show us, yeah. point out or, or, or give us an idea of some of the dates there. Uh, so we've got 14th of June there. We've got 3rd of August DLI there. And then we've got a 1st of August DLI. We've got an 11th of June DLI. We have got another 11th of June. So I'm guessing that's around the St. Pierre area. Um, oh, there's an Essex fellow, is it? Tessic, you only Paul, you don't care about them. Uh, I care about 17th, them all, Colin. Seventeenth <laughs> of June, I know you do. Seventeenth of June, so basically after the Longev attack has happened, and we've held the village, they're going to be replaced on the evening by the Gloucesters from the Fifty Sixth Brigade, uh, and they go out basically to rest and refit, resupply. But they've only got two days because on the seventeenth they're back in action. There is no time to rest the brigades properly. Um, and so they're back, it, back on it. Um, we're trying to push over the hot oil bag to the south. We've got to retake Tilly, of course, and then move towards Villa Bacars, which is a long way off happening. But, yeah, so very little time. There's another Durham on the 11th there. Lots of Lincolns over here from the 25th of June. Ah, uh, what else have we got? You've got Lancers. Uh, 24th Lancers, because their, their, their D-Day objective was was not far away, was it? When I mean, uh, yeah. when Alex Scott was on my show June the 6th last year and talking about his father and his grandfather and 24th Lancers, and their, their objective on D-Day was like 16 miles in land from uh, Gold Beach, which seems a tad ambitious. But, but this it is. Great, haven't, people haven't followed. This is the Tilly Sur Sur Commonwealth Wargrave Cemetery. Um, one of the reasons we like filming at this time of day is you can appreciate the absolutely beautiful sunlight there. Um, and we are beaming you this live. I know sometimes there are internet connectivity issues. It's not watching like a BBC History Channel thing, but we're bringing you this live. We're doing our absolute best with our technology. Sometimes we have some of these hurdles, but this year, Tell you so, so, um, it's one of the... Um, it's not one of the smallest. It's got sort of an average size, bigger one. Yeah, yeah. It's It's not... One of the big ones, it's not one of the small ones. It in the middle of summer, isn't it? Beautifully, yeah, kept. yeah, absolutely, as they all are. And it's lovely to see because at this time of year, you get the added benefit of all the flowers being in bloom on the graves as well. Because every grave is planted with its own flower, yeah, which is really rather nice. And I think just adds a certain something, yeah. So, and I'm gonna, while we're here, Paul, I'm gonna show you my favorite one. 
Yeah, of course. So, Dorset's second battalion, Nathan Lerner. I just love the inscription. And it says, Fail fighting fascism from Cable Street to Normandy. Marie, Frank, and Natalie. So, for those who are not aware, Cable Street was in 1936, and this was a October big, uh, yeah, Octo uh, October. Uh, it was a what? Well, how do you describe it? it was, well, the, the British right wing fascists under Oswald Mosley were doing yeah. a kind of a parade, a public thing, and people for and, and explain this is a part of London full of a Jewish population working it's, class. It's, it's a very Irish. very big immigrant area in the East End of London, which is why, of course, Mosley chose it because it would annoy the most people. Yeah. And he believes, of course, that the police are going to protect him, which they probably. They, they did to the detriment of those who are being abused, by the way. And so the march is set for October 4th uh, as a show of strength. You've got all the black shirts marching like a military formation. And they were attacked by the crowds. And they put barriers across Cable Street to stop them from moving down it. And they got stuck on the corner. They were throwing uh, marbles, kids' marbles. So the police horses couldn't get purchased to chase the protesters. Um, but every single person who was jailed for Cable Street was a protester. Not a single black shirt was jailed. So it's it's, it, uh, We also know, because for those who watched my um, D-Day call-in show, Paul Reed, who I mentioned earlier, who, who is the kind of chief historian for Ledger Tours, his dad was also involved in that, in that incident as well. So this Nathan Lerner guy buried there had risen up against fascism in 1936 in Britain in a protest, riot, call it what you want, yeah. and then ended up dying in Normandy. And by the way, folks, if you do not know that, there's an incredible song by the British punk folk band, The Men They Couldn't Hang, called The Ballad of Cable Street. No, Look it up on ghost. YouTube. Paul, it's called The Ghost oh. of Cable Street. Oh, The Ghost of Cable Street. I do apologize. Ghost of That's Cable right. Street. Uh, That's right. The Ghost of Cable Street. Fantastic uh, song. Yeah, but Nathan Lerner is Jewish. Yeah. But there is no star of David on his grave because he'd lost his faith. Yeah. Uh, uh, hence the reason there is no religious symbol on his grave because um, the family didn't want it. So that is why there's no Star of David because some people wonder why he hasn't got one. Yeah. He, the family didn't want one. Simple as that. And we think, yeah. don't we, Colin, because the new series of Peaky Blinders is fil filming that because Oswald Mosley was a character in the last season or series yeah. for the British American that presumably. There's, it's going to lead up to Cable Street. So if you, if you want to see this, we're assuming it's going to be portrayed on screen in some shape or form. And the um, the brothers are going to end up doing something. But Oswald Mosley was a character in the last series. So we're, we're, that's what we assume. So not that yeah. we're particularly referencing a, a BBC TV show, but it, it could end up covering this event here. And when we were told about this grave, weren't we, Colin, by Roman? And Roman did our friend. Yes, Roman. Roman brought it to our attention. It, it's just such a great oh, yeah. epitaph. It reminds us that when we think of the war starting in 1939, you could make all sorts of arguments that the war against fascism had started earlier. Yeah, uh, most definitely. Uh, Spain. Well, Spain, yes. <laughs> so 1936. I mean, it was Hitler's testing ground, so it has every right to be included as what was, well, certainly the lead up, but maybe was part of the Second World War because it springs from that, doesn't it? That ends in 39 with the fascist victory, uh, which is interesting why there's so many Spanish in the French forces that finally come back to Normandy with General Leclerc because they have escaped Spain because they're on the wanted list from Franco, settle in France, and of course then the Germans come and they have to get out for a second time and they join the French Second Armoured. Yeah. And they will come back. And, and the first troops into Paris on it on the night before the official liberation was a company of Spanish. Yeah. Which you will not read in many history books. Certainly and not. Our French friend one, Francois anyway. said thank you for mentioning the Spanish Civil War. He's another guy in Normandy. And Francois' oh, family oh, are yeah. Spanish. And he's also got a bit of a, a, a left wing communist interest as our Francois. So it's uh, Francois' uh, family it, fought in the war. They did. They did indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Francois, by the way. I'll see you for coffee soon. Yeah. Hi, Francois. It's like most guides in Normandy is going to be watching this night. And this is absolutely stunning. It's amazing that the connection there is better in a cemetery than it was in the town centre. That's Normandy for you. Perfect higher up, reception Paul. in the cemetery. Terrible in we're, the village. We're higher up here. Yeah, I guess so. The road rises so, up out, drops into a valley and then rises up. And this is probably the highest point in the area, I suppose. 
So at least one viewer has added Ghost of Cable Street Street to their YouTube music library. So we've converted. Uh, oh yeah, sure. It's it. fantastic band. I regularly tweet links to their songs. And they also um, did a fantastic version of what's the song? The First World War one. Ah, uh, yeah, Greenfields of France. Greenfields of France, yeah, yeah. which is uh, the Eric Borgel song. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah they're, some of their stuff is very political. Some of it is not political. They're still around, although one one member died last year, didn't Steph, they? Yeah. Stefan Cush died uh, earlier this year. He's the guy who does the vocals on Greenfields of France. Yeah, um, so the men that couldn't hang, fantastic band. <laughs> I can't believe we're talking about punk folk musicians on a World War II tour, but um, it's fantastic. And, yeah, check them out because they've done some really good historical songs um and yeah very much so Street, very much so yeah uh, well yeah. i mean anything else to sum up colin not a lot really the pictures speak for themselves don't they yeah you know when you're in a cemetery it's it just does absolutely speak for itself just look at it in the evening sun yeah and just these wonderful gravestones that serve as a constant reminder of what took place here 77 years ago you know and these and it's not just in normally these are everywhere these cemeteries they're all over northwest europe all through italy yeah in the desert of course the only man of the ninth battalion wake show to get the be awarded a victoria cross is buried in the middle of the desert somewhere so we had a cemetery we had the question, Colin, about what was the significance of the battle and what happened next. Well, more ah, well, and more of the same, isn't it? Really, I mean, it's more it's of not the a same. It's, battle. It's, it's just lots it's and lots of the same. Attrition. The whole point of the attack, as explained to brigadiers, uh, sorry, Lieutenant Colonels Green and Woods on the thirteenth, was we take, we hold, and then we exploit it by getting to hot all the bags. They didn't, because they couldn't. There wasn't enough of the 9th Battalion left to exploit anything that they'd created. The, the, the down now, you were saying a brigade's around 800 people. Battalion, this, yeah. Yeah, battalion, sorry. Uh, they started with 590, and they've just lost 248. And they're going to have to wait for very rapid replacement of officers because there's yeah. hardly any left. Yeah. Uh, Major, Major James Moog is uh, immediately promoted on the 14th. He becomes Lieutenant Colonel Moog. Um, and will command the battalion right through till the end of the war when he becomes uh, assistant, supreme assistant commander, NATO Europe. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and he also has some royal household position as well to the Queen. And essentially, uh, Colin, as we, as we, to, to, for people who, who aren't familiar with the American viewers and perhaps people around the world, is that you don't get any major breakthroughs now for a few weeks. This is when normally sticks like this. Yeah, it, oh, it is. It, it becomes very much kind of like a, It war. happens in a couple of weeks. It kind of stops start operation. Mm. Um, yeah. Windsor stops start. Charmwood, yeah. end of June, eventually. And then July, we take home. But basically... If you if we were doing these live shows every night for the next three weeks, it would be more and more of the same. American, oh, British, and Canadian a... taking a village, counterattacking, yeah. holding the village, and not yeah. quite achieving the ultimate objectives. Basically, is kind yeah. of the key for the next few days. This is just about the ninth TLI tonight. This is not the only battalion fight in Normandy at this stage. Yeah, all over Normandy, troops are being thrust into a battlefield thrown themselves, particularly in the eastern sectors, against the German armour. Because at this stage, the German armour is all here. Because it all arrives via con. And they haven't had a chance to get over to the west yet. So the German tanks are all hitting the British-Canadian lines. Trying yeah. to push them back into the sea. As uh, I can't remember Panzer Mayer's exact quote about something about... They will throw fish, those fishes it? back in the sea. That's yeah. the one, yeah, well... But, but, he, but then that's this, it came up, but he, we think he meant something worse than that because the translation of the German is more like pond life. We use the ah, word right. fishes. When you, when you actually translate yeah. it, it's more, I will throw that pond life back. It's, it's scum, is what he's yeah, saying. Yeah, basically, yeah. Fishes yeah. is kind of giving... It, giving out, it's, it's, a, it's a really nasty thing he said there, but... We've yeah. got some little comments in the sidebar, and I'll finish things off. The thing is, although in human terms, it takes some time for the Durham Light Infantry and the Green Howards and all these other units to replace their number, the armoured vehicles the Allies lose can be replaced fairly quickly. Oh. Now, the, from the German point of view, every Panther they lose in this village 
that's it. No replacements. They, Absolutely. They, they get like maybe a dozen come arrive to support these divisions. So every single time the Allies engage the Germans and we capture Germans and we knock out armored vehicles, we are blunting that enemy's ability to keep on yep. going. So explain that to a poor Durham Light Infantry guy being brought back on a carrier wounded that day. Yeah. What you've done, lads, is you've eliminated the German, German armor. He's not yeah. seeing that. But in, in the grand scheme which is why we get to the break, breakout later on, is when the breakout finally does happen, Cobra, Blue Coat, mm -hmm. and then Totalized and Tractable, is the Germans have lost so much armor in these engagements, the, break, the breakout does end up working. But at this stage, the, bit, the, the, the men on the ground can't really see that. And I guess even the commanders can't quite see it's going to no, change that. There. Not, certainly, certainly not at battalion level. I mean, they'll be seeing it at staff level, but at battalion level, no. All they're seeing is casualty figures. Which Woods did warn uh, Brigadier Walton about on the 13th. He said, taking this in in the morning, either go early morning or go at night. And he said, no, we go at 10.15. And he warned him that the casualties would be absolutely horrific going in broad daylight. Yeah. But, you know, Brigadier Walton, to be fair to him, he's got his orders from higher up and he's told it goes as soon as possible. You know, so, and they've got to get the artillery support into position. So that's going to take all night and into the morning, which is why they kicked off at 10.15 and suffered 248 casualties. And, and as Gert said yesterday, the problem with us looking at the Normandy timeline now is we only seem to be able to deal with one battle happening on one day. And we look at it that way. So June the 13th, the day before, Villa Bocage, mm -hmm. Bloody Gulch yeah. and Carenton. Um, yeah. It's an awful lot happening there. The, uh, the yeah. 29th Division crossing the Elbe River, the 2nd Division crossing the Elbe River. Uh, in the next few days, you've got other things happening over in the Canadian yeah. sector. You've got more stuff happening in the American sector. We're pushing towards Cherbourg. So unfortunately, in the yeah. grand scheme of things, battles like the Battle for Langev often fall through the cracks in the big they do. They do. And I'll tell you why in particular. Because on the 14th of June, a dignitary visited Bayeux. First time on French soil for a number of years. Yeah. Which was, of course, commemorated today. Uh, the dignitary was Charles de Gaulle, of course. And that's what people associate with the 14th of June in yeah. Normandy, the yeah. visit of de Gaulle. Uh, with the, the, I mean, they did a, a, a ceremony today. So they, and they Mag was there. Me. Mag was there. Yeah. Yeah. They, they recreated French the person. march. They recreated the march from there, starting at the Place au Palm at the bottom of town, up the main street, past the Renaissance uh, newspaper building, and then turned across and headed for Place de Gaulle, which is where the sous prefecture is. Which is basically yeah. where the French government was until the fall of Paris. Pretty much, yeah. And uh, yeah, yes, and we're, and we're not saying that the De Gaulle's visit wasn't important. It just in the end, no, with, the single, with the single timeline approach, the Battle of Langev becomes secondary to De Gaulle yeah. arriving in Bayeux. And because you know, to the okay. French people, what's more important, Langev or De Gaulle? And think of the morale boost that gives the French civilians, many of whom have had. The battles pass through their villages at this time. I know Bayer gets away pretty scot free, but lots of people would have come from the outlying villages to see De Gaulle that day. Yeah. And some of them have suffered terribly. And don't forget, many of the people around the area of Bayer, uh, there are quite a few who are deported to German labor camps and to concentration camps, and they never come back. And some of them are listed in the Place de Disparu in Bayer, which is near the cathedral. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's so you understand why, in terms of the French, it's far more important about de Gaulle being here yeah. than the sufferings of the Durham Light Infantry, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah. But both events are equally as important, and they shouldn't be, for, neither should be forgotten, and nor should any of the others. The 6th Attack in Berriers, the 231st Brigade throwing themselves into Sonodier and the Belle Epine. I think Sean did a, a good thread on that this morning on. Um, yeah. Twitter, people are interested, should follow Shawnee Boy. He's very good on Twitter with his history stuff. Um, so, yeah, there's lots going on. It isn't just about the gated Gurkhas, as they're known. Um, it's about all of them, but you can't cover everything at once. And when, when Villa Bocage was liberated, was it 4th of August, Colin? I think it was, wasn't it? Uh, early August? Yeah, but there's nothing standing, is there? No, I, I just want to. I just pulled the map up again in case people are wondering yeah. how long it takes. So look yeah. at the map again, folks. We're here. It's not that floor. far. We're just north on the tenth of June, but the places like Villa Bocage don't get liberated until early August. So effectively, it's nearly two months to go. And you can the distance on that map 
that's about six miles there. So, yeah, six miles in two months. Obviously, there's things happening elsewhere. They're, we're taking the Sherbourne Peninsula. There's other, but yeah, this this is a Almost slow there. grudge attrition match, and that's why the graves where yeah. you are are June, July, and August because well, and well into August, yeah. The battlefield oh, yeah. doesn't move. It, well, well I think we'll leave it at that because um, we'll, we'll we'll let you go. Um, yeah. Thanks very much for your presentation. Thank Mag for doing the camera work. And thank I'm you, Mag, for wonderful camera work out. as always. I'll just uh, put it on, I'll, I'll put it on my image again. So, folks, um, I'm actually taking a bit of a break. I, I, the Asville show I had planned for the 16th. I'm actually postponing. I'm just not quite ready to do it yet. So, we've got on Thursday evening. Uh, we've got a great show about the 8th Battalion Rifle Brigade. That's kind of a summary of their entire uh, Normandy campaign. So D-Day about the men, operations, Epsom, Good, uh, Goodwood and Bluecoat. So an expansion of what we're doing tonight. Then a few days off. Then Medics Week ne uh, begins next week. So actually, I've got a quiet few days, but I do actually need to kind of recharge my batteries a bit. I've been working like stink getting these powerpoints ready and stuff so i do apologize but join us thursday evening for a great show about the right eighth battalion rifle brigade so thanks colin thanks mag i'll get the Welcome. oven on because colin's having dinner with us tonight um yeah. so see you later then folks cheers for everybody watching don't forget follow us on social media the link to colin's twitter account is in below to colin's guiding page is below mag's guiding page and we'll see you all again on world war ii tv on thursday thank you everybody bye cheers paul bye